Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand with us and read aloud our call to worship this morning? Our call to worship this morning is 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We're going to learn a new song this morning, and so we're going to sing it right now, and then later after the message, we'll get a chance to sing it again together. There's peace that outlasts darkness, hope that's in the blood, there's future grace that's mine today, that Jesus Christ has won.
You're freeing hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers and I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Good morning. 
Hey, at this time, children can be dismissed for children's church. I'm, I feel like I'm blind. Oh, that's better. Well, happy Mother's Day, moms. You know, you, yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody said happy Mother's Day to me. I'm like, um, thank you, I think. <clears throat> uh, just a few... <laughs> few announcements. Uh, today, so you, as you walked in, you saw the baby bottles as you were walking in. That's, uh, if you don't know what that's all about, that's our, one of our ways to support uh, Life Choice Pregnancy Center. So you take one of those home, you fill it with you know, change or, or money, and then you bring it back, <clears throat> and then we, we, uh, we give that to, to Life Choice as a way of just funding them and helping them do uh, what, what they're doing in Cheyenne, which we are completely supportive. We, we love what they're doing. And then um, if you're, next week, if you're curious about the worship team, if you want to know more about how you might be able to serve on the worship team, uh, next week after, I don't know what is it, after, uh, stop by room five after the second service for pizza to chat with Thomas and some of the worship team about whatever area you may be interested in. So, uh, so that's just, we're looking to fill up our, our worship team, and, and so that's next week. And then June 4th, we're having a church picnic so we're still going to have our worship services here, uh, but there's going to be a group that's going to be, I think they're going to be camping. I, I don't camp. My version of camp is a hotel, a nice warm bed, and a TV. Yes, yes, they're camping. Uh, but they'll be up there, and there'll be food ready, and so if you're like me, and you're really not into camping, you can drive up right after the service and meet up with everybody that's going to be up there. Uh, there will be hamburgers, hot dogs. Uh, bring a side uh, to share along with some kind of camping chair. All right, sound cool? Awesome. All right, we're going to pray. And uh, what we'll do is... I'm just going to guide us uh, through a time of prayer. We've got a full service. Uh, Rachel is going to... It's got, Rachel Abraham is going to come up later after, towards the end of my message, and we're going to talk about some things. And so I'm just going to guide us through a time of prayer. So let's do this. Let's, let's just start just to just quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, just, uh, uh, just, just in your own heart. Just, just ask God to just to pray, prepare your heart for today. Um, and then I'll just pray for some of the things that, uh, that we have listed that we want to pray for. God, you're doing all kinds of things in our world today. And uh, we praise you for it. We thank you for it. We lift up the Hicks family who you're using in a very difficult region in, in the world. God, use them profoundly. Use them powerfully. All the things that are needed for them to accomplish the mission that you've called them to, God, we ask that you will provide that you will open doors for them to be able to share the gospel and to see people come to know your, your son as Savior. And um, God, this, there's so much hurt and pain represented in our world today. I mean, just, just even th this week alone, just, just the news and uh, mass shootings and broken marriages or families and just lots of pain. And so God, I just ask that you will just use us, use, use your church, not just here in Cheyenne, but all over this nation and this world, that you would use your church to be a light where light is so desperately needed and to be salt where salt is so desperately needed. God, that we would be that. And God, in this room and those watching the live stream, I, I, I don't know all the pain that's represented in this room and I don't know all the grief that's represented in this room, but you do. And so God, I ask that you will just meet 
those who are grieving, those who are in pain, those who are just not sure what the next step is, that you would just meet them in the midst of their grief and the gospel, uh, the hope of the gospel, that which you promise us, God, would be so clear, but not just clear, but it would be so tangible in a way that, that uh, we would just be able to grab on to the hope that is ours in Jesus in a way that is sustaining, sustaining in the midst of, of pain and heartache and, and whatever else is going on that's represented in this room. Have your way with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, how many of you uh, moms took advantage of the, mother, the, the Mother's Day cookie thing at Mary's Mountain Cookies? Okay, you need to do that. So just go there. Say, hey, I'm from Meadowbrook. You need to be, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're not a mom, I, you could get away with just saying, hey, I'm from Meadowbrook. If you're a guy and you, get to, and you say, hey, I'm from Meadowbrook, they may ask you, are, are you a mother? Um, to which you will say, no. <laughs> So anyway, that's until tomorrow, May 15th. So take advantage of that. That's our way of just, just blessing you moms. Um, they have really good cookies. I, I love cookies, and I told my wife she should go there and get one of those cookies so that I can have some. <laughs> so. so you could do that too. If you're, not, if, you, if you're a mom and you're not into cookies, but you know your husband is, you could do Anyway, all right, I don't want to get in trouble. Okay, we, <laughs> we are in, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. That's where we're going to camp. And so if you could stand to honor the reading of God's word, that would be great. Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin with verse 18. This is the word of the Lord. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning toward, or, or together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows uh, what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You may be seated. So, why preach a sermon on overcoming or surviving overwhelming grief on Mother's Day? Well, I don't know if you know this, but uh, statistically speaking, women in childbearing age tend to suffer from depression, I believe, two times, or two times more likely to suffer from depression than men. Uh, I, my wife and I are going to be celebrating this Tuesday our 25th wedding anniversary. And so, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, it's gone by really fast. We have two sons. And I know that, uh, that just watching, watching my wife you know, be a mother, is, is, it's difficult for moms. Especially when you see your child doing things you don't want them to do or, or your child is dealing with something that you have no control and, 
in, in helping your child you know, through other than maybe lightening the burden a little bit. So I think this is very appropriate. I think it's very appropriate that uh, we address grief and how, how your faith can survive grief or overwhelming grief and, and what that looks like. You know, the Apostle Paul experienced, I think, a lot of grief. Well, he certainly suffered a lot. I don't know if, uh, if you've ever suffered to the point where you found yourself in a state of depression, but it's easy to fall into that place. You know, Tim Keller said something I thought was interesting. I read this this week uh, from his book titled Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. He said this. He said, no matter what precautions we take, no matter how well we have put together a good life, no matter how hard we have worked to be healthy, wealthy, comfortable with friends and family, and successful with our career, something will inevitably ruin it. Yeah, any of you have dreams that didn't pan out the way that you wanted them to? Right? Some of you probably are, you know, dealing with grief over that. On October 9th, 2021, Cliff Abraham succumbed to complications due to COVID and died. Many of you know who, know who he was and who he is. As my grandma would say, you know, this, when it comes to death, this is for the Christian anyway, this is not goodbye, this is see you later. But it doesn't, it doesn't take the sting of death away. Um, Cliff and his wife, Bonnie, they hosted a life group. Uh, Cliff loved Jesus, it was obvious. Uh, frequently after the worship service, he and I would talk for a little bit. He loved his wife, his children. Uh, Rachel w would be described as a daddy's girl. She's going to talk a little bit about that uh, later on today. I preached on Romans chapter 8 at his memorial service that was held here. And uh, I'd like to think of this message as part two of that, of that, of that message. The one verse that I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time reflecting on at Cliff's memorial service is Romans chapter 8, verse 18. And that's the one I'm just going to camp on for the rest of our time together. We'll, we'll look at other verses. So my, my encouragement to you is if you have a Bible that you'll, you, you're able to open to it, if, you have, if you're looking at your Bible on your digital device, a phone, iPad, or whatever, that you, you just want to hang out at, in Romans chapter 8 because we're just going to camp there. I, I think, well, my hope is that you'll be, you'll be helped through our time together in Romans chapter 8. But I just, just think about that. Think, think about Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, not, not the past, not the future, but the sufferings that I'm, that, that I'm experiencing now, that, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be, you know, future tense, revealed to us. That the, that the, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to this great glory that's going to be revealed to us. That's, that, th there's so much in that verse that I think is helpful. Rachel was the one who submitted the topic, hey, I, I think it would be good for you to address you know, grief and how your faith you know, can survive you know, overwhelming grief. She asked to meet with me. She's a part of the youth group. For, this is the last, you know, this is the, her last year in, in high school. But uh, she asked to meet with me, and, and we, said, we went, met at, at uh, Dasbog and talked about it. And she said, you know, I'm struggling. I'm str and she, I, mean, I don't want to get into everything she's going to say later on, but she said, I'm struggling. I'm struggling w with my faith and just this overwhelming grief you know, over, over the loss of my father. And as I reflected, on, as we had that conversation, as I reflected upon that conversation since then, there's so much that helps us in verse 18 that Paul offers here. Like this, the sufferings of this present time and this glory that is to be revealed to us. I want you to think about this. The Apostle Paul, not knowing what was going to happen to his life. He was either under house arrest or in prison when he wrote Philippians. Wrote at the very beginning of this letter to the Philippians, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out 
for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And then he said this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And later on in, in his, little, his little letter to the Philippians, he said, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm kind of torn. I don't, if, I, if, if, I, if God delivers me from this prison and he allows me to live, well, then it's fruitful labor for Jesus Christ that I can continue to, to, to enjoy. If he doesn't let me go home, if I do lose my life, then, then it's gain. That's the way he looked at death. When, when he was... When death was imminent and he knew that he was soon to be beheaded because he was a Roman citizen, he would not have to face crucifixion, he wrote 2 Timothy. Uh, it's the second letter he wrote to this young pastor. Probably Timothy was probably in his 30s. Paul was about 65 most likely, between 60 and 65 years old. And he said this about what was coming. He said, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Now that's a loaded phrase right there. At the temple where the altar was, um, just outside of the, the, the Holy of Holies, there was this place where the sacrifice would be offered and they would pour out a drink offering. Uh, it was a way of worshiping the Lord. Paul said, my life is like that drink offering. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, and this is a promise to all of us, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I mean, in the midst of suffering, overwhelming suffering, I would, I would say, for Paul, he was holding on to something. Like, he wasn't willing to let it go, and because he was holding on to that something, it, it made his present-day sufferings dim in comparison and then you, you think about all that he did suffer. Like he, in, to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he, he said that he was uh, imprisoned and under house arrest multiple times, and then he lost count of all the many beatings that he suffered for his faith. Like he literally says, I've lost count. I, I can't count how many times I've been beat up because of my faith in Jesus Christ. And then he continued to go on, and he said, For five times I received at the hands of Jews the forty lashes less one. It's thirty-nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me for, uh, of my anxiety for all the churches. That's a lot. And, and, and in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul says, it, those present day sufferings, I, I, they dim compared to this glory that is to be revealed, not just to Paul, but he says, to us. To, to anyone in this room who's placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your present day sufferings dim in comparison to a glory that is to be revealed to you. That's the promise of the gospel. And I, it reminds me of what he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse, verse 8. For, let, let's read this together, ready? For we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So there, there's really just two points here in my, in my sermon. The first is that we will suffer before we experience glory. Now I want to define what that glory is because there are some, some pastors, so-called pastors in the church who would say that we were destined for a type of glory that makes us the center of God's universe. That is not what Paul's saying here. There's a glory that is to be revealed to us, that will be given to us, that we will experience, but it's not about us. It's about who this God is. God, listen, God is the center of his universe, and that is good news. 
That is really, really good news. Think about it. If you, like, Keith Miller is not as good as it gets, and neither are you. You're not as good as it gets. God is as good as it gets. The ultimate gift that God could give to you is the greatest reality in all the universe, and the greatest reality in the universe is not you, and it's not me, it's God. That's why God is the center of the universe. He, he, it's all about him. And, and Paul says, the present day sufferings in light of this glory that this God is going to give to us makes all my sufferings dim in comparison. Like, like, who are the sons of God? The sons of God are the children of God. If you're a Christian, listen, if you are a Christian, you are a child of the living God. That's what Paul says here. Like, if you are a Christian, you are a son, you are a daughter of the God of all creation. And you know what that means? Here's what it means. It means that he loves you as a father loves a son or as a father loves a daughter. I was talking to one of, we had an elder board meeting this week and I was talking to one of our elders and we were praying for him and I said, you know, because he's dealing with some health issues and, uh, and I said, you know, God, God, is, as I was praying, I was reflecting on that God will be an imp- is infinitely a better husband than he ever could be to his wife. That God is infinitely better, a better father than he could ever be to his children. Dads, I mean, and this is a Mother's Day, I mean, it's Mother's Day today, but dads, God is, God will infinitely always be better, a better husband than you could be to your wife. God is infinitely better at fathering or being a, a, a father than you could ever dream of being. And the same is true of you, moms. Like, that's how much God loves you. So Paul's reflecting on this, like, God loves me so much that these, there's, a, there's design and purpose behind the sufferings that I'm experiencing today. And, and, and they dim in comparison to what, to what he has in store for me in the future. And to be a child of God is to be a person who has received the abundance of grace and the free gift of God's righteousness. That's Romans chapter 5. Where Paul says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. You know what that means? That means what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, is for you, and no one will ever take that away. And the only one that has the ability to take that away has promised that he will never take that away. Like, so Paul says, in the midst of my present day sufferings, there's this glory that's waiting for me. In second, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, <laughs> should have had that as a second passage. So he, Paul writes this, he says, so we do not lose heart. Think about that. We do not lose heart. Why, Paul? Though our outer self is wasting away. Anybody feel that? Right? <laughs> Like, my neck hurts this morning. I don't know why. <laughs> it's the way I slept. The, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us, what? It, say it together, an eternal weight of glory. Well, what, is that, what does that look like? He says, well, it's beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Like this is the, that's the glory that is to be revealed to us. And all through the epistles, not just Paul, not just the ones that Paul wrote, but through the epistles and through the gospels and even through the, New, the Old Testament, we're reminded that there is a glory that will be revealed to us. And so you're wondering, okay, Keith, so how do I survive overwhelming grief and how does my faith survive that? You've got to hold on to the reality that there's purpose and design behind your present-day sufferings, and that those present-day sufferings don't, don't hold, I mean, they don't compare to the glory that God has for you. Like, he is doing something in your life to prepare, to prepare you for this glory that he promises to give you. Here's, here's an, this is, I don't know if you want to call this my soapbox or whatever, but this is why the teaching that financial blessing 
physical well-being and easy living is always the will of God for your life is an abomination. And because nowhere do, are we promised an easy life. Paul, look at Paul. I mean, like verse 18, it's all there. The, he, these present day sufferings. Paul didn't have a Mercedes Benz. He didn't have the job that he always, you know, he didn't have financial security. I mean, we learned that from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He was shipwrecked. He was at sea. He, he was frequently spent the night outside in the cold without food. And he says, those sufferings dim in comparison to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Listen, God's will for your life is not a suffering-free life because to follow Jesus requires a cross-bearing life. The one we follow warned us in this world. This is what he said. He said in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So moms, like when you're looking at your children, like we have moms all over the spectrum here. We have new moms and we have grandmoms and we have great-grandmothers uh, that are represented here as a part of, you know, Meadowbrook Church. And as you look at your children or your grandchildren and you're scratching your head, what, you know, how is God going <laughs> to turn this around? You can know that he, there's design in the midst of suffering. And it might not go the way that you want it to go. Like there, I, one, of our, one of the ladies who, who, who's not been at Meadowbrook for some time because she's been undergoing cancer treatment for pancreatic cancer. I saw her yesterday. And um, it's a reminder to me that, man, that, there's something, God is doing something, and it might not go the way that we want it to go, but he's doing something. There's purpose and design behind it, and, and the pain that we experience now dims in comparison to the glory that he's going to reveal to us. Like, so we don't lose heart, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. <laughs> I've overcome the world. And, Here's the other thing that is important to, to keep in mind. Just because you're suffering, so whether that's the death of your husband or your father or your mother or, or somebody close in your life or whether that's cancer or, or the loss of a job or whatever it is that is your present day suffering today, that doesn't mean, listen, that does not mean that God is displeased with you or that he's angry with you. It could mean that he's disciplining you, and there is, there, there is a, a lot in the Bible that teaches that if you sin, that the repercussions of your sin could, could be a form of discipline from the Lord that will hurt. I mean, I've shared the story of my father who had an affair. I don't think he was fully repentant, and, and two weeks before he died, he told, he told the place where he worked that he, he told them a lie about his marriage, and then two weeks later, he took a bath and had a massive heart attack and died in, his tub, in, the, in the bathtub. And I believe the Lord was disciplining him. But most, most of the things that you experience when it comes to pain, whether it's cancer or a death in the family or whatever it may be, is not necessarily because God is displeased with you. It's because he's treating you as a son or a daughter. He's disciplining you. He's molding and shaping you. And some discipline is the result of sin, and some discipline is God is doing something in your life. He's molding and he's shaping you be, be, for, for this future reality that, that you will receive. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says this. It is for, because these were suffering Christians, that the, if you read Hebrews, you'll, you'll discover that there's a group of Christians that were suffering for their faith. They had lost, some of them lost their homes, some of them were in danger of losing their lives, maybe some of them even got sick, and the author of Hebrews, who we don't know who wrote Hebrews, said this, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. He's treating you as children, as his children. For what child or what son is there whom his father does not discipline. If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. For the moment all discipline seems what? Painful. <laughs> Anybody like, yeah, it's 
It hurts rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Uh, you know, I tend to be the disciplinarian in our family. Now, both boys are old enough to where we, like Seth is still, like he's 12, so he's getting, he's, his voice is changing. He, he just discovered he has an Adam's apple. Don't, he, I don't know what's going on with him. He's like, Dad, I have an Adam's apple. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> he's like fascinated by this. And his voice was changing. Why is my voice changing? Because you're going through puberty, which is a reminder that pretty soon you're going to lose your brain. Like, I, <laughs> it's puberty-induced amnesia. That's what I call it. Where your child enters that stage where they forget who they are and they forget who you are <laughs> in the house. I'm the parent. You're the child. Remember that, right? Um, <clears throat> And so, but we were, we were talking about this yesterday, about just some of the, you know, discipline. One time, my boys are going to kill me. Um, one time Nathan said something he, when he was, I don't even know how old he was. You know, the first child tends to get m the more severe discipline than the second child, right? Because the like, first child, you're just trying to figure it out. Second child, you're like, okay, I can relax a little bit. It's going to be okay. Uh, third child, I, I don't know what happens. Uh, we just have two children. But so how many of you have three children? Okay, so you know. Um, <clears throat> so, so I, uh, he said, he said, a, I don't even know what word he said. He, he must have, he said something he heard at school. He said a curse word. And so, you, don't judge me for this. I, um, <laughs> but I, <clears throat> he had to sit for I don't know a minute or two minutes with a bar of soap in his mouth. And they were reflecting on it, and Zeldon, who's back home from college now, and Seth were making fun of that, trying to reenact what that may have been like, because neither Zeldon or Seth, Seth wasn't even born yet, what that may have looked like. And I'm like, you guys are just goofy. Um, when I disciplined Seth, you know, there were three strikes. We had like a three-strike rule. There was a warning, and then there was a, you sit on the couch, because we wanted the bedroom to be a, a kind of a safe place for them, so we didn't send them to their bedrooms because we wanted that not to be a place of discipline, but a place where they can just be the whoever. Um, and so, and then the third one was, we believe in spanking, was a spanking. And very rarely, because Seth was pretty easy, very rarely did it get to the point of Seth being, needing to be spanked, but, but I would sit down with him, and <laughs> he'll tell you that this was the worst part of it. I was thinking I was being really gracious and just emphasizing how much I loved him because I would sit there and I'd tell him, Seth, I love you. I love you so much. He knew a spanking was coming. I love you so much. This breaks my heart that I have to do this. So, so you're going to get a spanking, but I want you to sit on the couch and just think about it, <laughs> which was the worst part of it. Um, and we didn't spank to hurt. In fact, probably rarely heard him. It was more of a, an anticipation that it was coming. So I think he cried hardest leading up to the spanking. Then, he got, then we got it over with. Like that, but why? Why would I do that? Because I cared for him. I was disciplining him. I, I, he was my son. It mattered to both my wife and I that our children grew up to be um, not just respectable citizens in the United States, but, to, but their character would be formed and shaped. The, the author of Hebrews is saying, look, when you're experiencing suffering in this world, know that there's purpose and design behind it. God is, is, not, is not this mean, vindictive, angry father. He loves you, and he's doing something in your life. I'm reminded of William Cooper's uh, hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. There's just two, two verses I want to share with you, and the words are not on the screen, but just listen to this. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. God frowns uh, behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. So judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, up unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Amen? Like God is doing something, which leads me to the second point, and this will be brief, and that is, it is a good God who will reveal the glory to us. Like he is a good God. And Paul emphasizes that in Romans chapter 8. He's a good God. I'm reminded of Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, who 
had a, a profound influence upon my thinking, upon my theology. He was a pastor. He pastored a church for 30 years. Uh, he developed throat cancer and, um, and lost his battle to throat cancer. But he said of this verse, he, 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 in one of his sermons, he said, and the words are on the screen here, he said, the great reality is the glory that is coming. He, and this is his advice. Hold on to this idea that we do not really belong to this present age, that our citizenship is in heaven. This present world is passing, transient, temporary. The world to come is the real, the permanent world. That is the one that has substance and which will endure forever. That's what you hold on to. And when he was diagnosed with throat cancer, he, they, they tried to fight it, and he got all kinds of treatment for it, and it just wasn't working. And when it became a reality that he was not going to get any better, he decided, he met with his family, and he decided, I'm not going to receive any more treatment. And so uh, it got to the point where he could barely talk, and eventually he lost all use of his voice. That's like one of the worst things for a pastor, by the way, to experience, is when you don't have a voice anymore. And um, he, he was meeting with his doctor, and his doctor was trying to convince him, you should take, you should take this medicine, it will, it, it will at least you know, make you feel better. And, and Martin Lloyd-Jones said, it's okay. In fact, he told his family, he said, don't pray that God will heal me anymore, because I do not want you to hold me back from the glory. That's what he said to his family. He was 80-some years old when he, was, when he, when he got to the, that, last, that last season of his life, that last, that last page in the last chapter of his life. And his doctor said this. He said, it grieves me to see you sitting here weary and worn and sad. And he could barely talk, and he was able to mumble out of his mouth, not sad, not sad. And he pointed to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. And that's one of my favorite stories about him. James Montgomery Boyce was another pastor. I got to hear him preach at, in chapel at, one of the Bible, at the Bible college I graduated from. And he had just been diagnosed with liver cancer. No, I think it was actually pancreatic cancer. And um, when he found out that he had been diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer, he said to his congregation, the congregation at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, he said, if you want to know how to pray for me, pray that God would be glorified through this. How could he say that? Because this present sufferings of this, of, of, of this present time are not worth compare, being compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's how, that's how you can hold on to your faith so that overwhelming grief will not, will not overcome you. And it, it, it sounds simple or simplistic, but it's, it, it, it is like when you are focusing on a reality that's greater then anything that you will ever experience in this reality, this future reality is greater than anything you will experience in this reality, it will get you through those tough times. Like, what is this glory that's, being revealed, that's going to be revealed to us? Well, Peter wrote about it, 1 Peter chapter 1, that it's an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. I read that verse to, to, to Cliff as he was dying. Well, at the time, he was still just struggling with COVID. But I read this verse to him when he was in the hospital. That we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The glory that Paul is writing about that, says, that makes everything that, that, that I'm suffering now dim in comparison of what's going to be given to me, we, we, we read about it in Revelation 21. For I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. 
He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Listen, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Amen? Like, that is, that is the, 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 the coming glory that we will receive. And everything else dims in comparison. Rachel, you can come up. Um, <clears throat> so I want, I'm going to have Rachel come and um, we're going to talk. So you can have a seat there. This is Rachel. Say hi, Rachel. <laughs> Many of you know who she is. Um, yeah, it's on. Is it on? Yes, you're on. Cool. Um, but one of the things, you know, so re you reached out to me and you, you asked to meet with me because you were struggling. Um, and I thought it would be good for everybody here and those watching the live stream to kind of hear a little bit of, of that, that story and also that part of that conversation that we shared. So why don't you start and we'll just, we can have a, a conversation while you All share. Right. Um, so Pastor Keith likes to do this thing in youth group. Like, once in a while, well, he, will, he will do basically a questionnaire like he does normally in church. And um, before he did this questionnaire, months beforehand, like, I kind of went through this really, like, dark, deep spot in my life, going through grief, depression, and it was just taking over. And I honestly had no interest in going to church anymore, if I'm being honest. And the main reason I went to youth group was basically to make my mom happy. And I just, I didn't really feel the need because I was almost having like this fight with God. Like, why did he do this? And because church was a huge part of my father's life. And going to church with my, with my dad was always something we did as a family. And so when he wasn't there anymore, it kind of just didn't feel right. Um, so when he had this questionnaire, um, I kind of asked it in like a third person type thing, more of like I'm asking it for a friend. <laughs> Um, I was like, how do you help someone that's dealing with, you know, grief and de depression and struggling with their faith? And after I asked that question and he was answering it, it's almost like I felt my dad, like, punching me in the arm. And he was just like, you need to go talk to Pastor Keith. And so that's when I was like, hey, like, after youth group, like, I was just like, hey, can I, can I meet up with you? Can I talk? Because I'm really, like, struggling right now with my faith to keep it. And so that's kind of how that started. Him and I met up at Dazbog. We talked for, I think, like an hour or two. Um, and from then on, I kind of just, he, what he explained to me, like, it is completely normal for that to happen. Like, it's okay for you to struggle with your faith after something like that happens. Just remember, you have to go back to where you were before with your faith. So it's okay to have, you know, you're going to have ups and downs with your faith, and that's completely okay. Um, so like I said, I was just, I was struggling really, really hard. Um, and then with the holidays coming up, because it was right around the holidays, it was just making it 10 times harder. Um, I really hit that really dark spot, like right before um, his one year of passing, and it is starting on my senior year. Um, so it was just definitely a really hard spot in my life because I was just like it kind of set in that he's been gone for that long and it just tore me down so yeah there's yeah. there's a quote that I read earlier this week it's in my notes uh, by Evelyn Underhill I've never even heard of her but what she what she wrote was really I thought profound and good if God were small enough to be understood he wouldn't be big enough to be worshipped and so I thought one of the things, like, when we struggle with, with grief, and it's, so one of the things I don't want you to hear in anything that I said today is that it's, that I don't want you to hear that it's not okay to have questions or to, or to struggle. I mean, of course you're going to struggle. Like, when my dad died, I, I had to go to counseling mm -hmm. or, you know, to work through that stuff and questions that I had. And, and so there's... <laughs> I actually even I shared this with the youth, but I also shared this a few times here that we have, like the Bible, God has gifted us in the Bible language of lament. 
Like even Jesus on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting one of the Psalms. You have Job, you have Lamentations. You have many of the Psalms in the Bible that, are, that express lament over things that we just don't understand. Like David would like, why, why, does, why do you bless my enemy and here I am like in a cave somewhere? Like, what, what, what's going on? And so. Yeah, so around that time, um, I had many people um, like question why I wasn't going to church. They're just like, are you coming to church today? All that. And I was just like, no, I'm not feeling the greatest. Like I kind of would say a little bit of a white lie just to kind of get out of it. Um, and after I realized that I, how hard I was struggling, um, mom and I ended up going to family counseling because our relationship was honestly kind of fading. Um, my dad was probably one of my biggest supports. And so after he died, like I really kind of felt alone for a while. Um, but as mom and I went through family counseling, it got a lot better. Um, that was another time in my life where I, I'm pretty sure dad was just like, dude, go get some help. Like, <laughs> like my dad was one of those people who was just like, he would like kick you or punch you, be like, go get help, you know? <laughs> um, so within that time, um, I almost became sort of a spectic towards God because I was like, why would he do this stuff? Is it, is he really in heaven? Like, what is, ha like, I was like, what is happening? Like, is this, is it really true that he went to heaven? Is he really watching over me? Is it just like, after you die, is it just black screen, nothing else, you know? And I almost became kind of a spectic towards it. And then after a couple months of kind of being a spectic about it, I was like, my dad would have wanted me to do better. He would have wanted me to try to fix my faith. He wanted me to keep my faith even in the midst of struggling. So that's when, you know, I went to Pastor Keith and, you know, got help. And then I was like, God has glorified so much of this even in the midst of suffering. All of this is happening for a reason, and I hate that it happens for a reason, <laughs> but it's all part of his plan, and it's, it was really hard for me to accept that it was a part of his plan, but I finally accepted the fact that it is part of his plan. I'm going to be grieving for Lord knows how long or the entire rest of my life. It just gets easier. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, so there are all kinds of verses that's, that say the same thing. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it defines faith, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul even, you know, I, we read it earlier in Romans chapter 8, that what, hope is, it, we hope in that which we can't see right now. It's, it doesn't mean that it's not a reality. It doesn't mean that it's not real. It's just not here yet. And, uh, and so there, like that passage in Revelation 21, one day God's going to wipe away the tears that stain our eyes. And uh, there are times where I still, I st like the wound of, of my father's death is still there. And so I still struggle every once in a while. And, but I still, but for me, I, I, and it sounds like this is what you're doing too, I keep going back to these promises in the Bible and I hold on to those, just like the Apostle Paul did, just holding on to those. Um, because they're infinitely greater. Those promises are infinitely greater than any pain that you could experience in this life. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard the song um, Show Me Around by Carly Pierce. It's a country song, but it talks about... Um, I actually heard it last night. I was at work, and I had, a, I had an earbud in while I was cleaning, and I just had, like you know, one of those enhanced shuffles on where it like adds stuff in. And this was one of the songs that talks about like uh, someone close to you is up in heaven. And one of the lines is, I've only read about what you've seen and what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And that's, I kind of keep that in my heart. It's like, I, I've only read it, but your faith helps you believe it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. There's, so that song that we sang, which the worship mm -hmm. team's going to come up and, and conclude our time in a minute, uh, 
But I love that line. There's peace that outlasts darkness. Hope that's in the blood. The future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow, for tomorrow's in your hands. All I need, you will provide, just like, you've always, just, just like you always have. And then I'm fighting a battle you've already won. Think about that. I'm fighting a battle that you've already won. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Don't know what you're doing. So that's, that's the okay part. Like, you don't have to know what he's doing. You can still have questions. Don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done meaning he's been faithful, so he'll continue to be faithful, even though I don't understand, like, why my dad died, or why your dad died, or, you know, why Bonnie's husband passed away. You know, like, I don't have all the answers, and that's okay, because I know God is faithful. Mm -hmm. and, and he's going to continue to be faithful. How do I know that? Because of, of all that he's done so far. Like, what we read in the Bible, the way he's been faithful in our lives. Um, so I'm fighting a battle you've already won. And I, I love that line. I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. You're the one who saves. You're my savior, my defense, so we don't have to be afraid. No more fear in life or death. And so, anyway. But I just, w w a good example, I, I mean, a good thing just to take away from this is that Rachel was struggling and she had the courage to come up and say, and finally just say, can we just talk? It's, a, it's okay to ask for help. I'm one of those people I hate asking for help. <laughs> I've, I'm a pretty independent person. I don't like asking for help. But after I, you know, started conflicting and felt my dad punching my arm, <laughs> basically, is what it felt like, um, that's when I was like, okay. I've gone through this for too long. I need to go do something about it. Um, you, it's good to know when to ask for help. It's okay to ask for help. And, and if any of you guys are struggling, he's great to talk to. <laughs> that is for sure. Um, it, and it really just reassured me after he told me that all of this is completely normal. It is completely normal to struggle with your faith after going through a hard time in your life. Yeah, so if you guys can come up. Thank you, Rachel, yeah. for sharing. That's <laughs> okay. They'll, they'll, they'll mute it. I would invite you to stand if you want to, sit if you want, uh, but just really reflect on this song, um, reflect on what Pastor Keith just talked about and uh, what Rachel said, and uh, just let this be a reminder of the fact that the battle is not ours. It has already been won. It's already been paid for. Uh, God is sovereign above all things. Let's start with the chorus, please, Jason. I'm fighting a battle You've already won No matter what comes my way I will overcome Don't know what you're doing But I know what you've done And I'm fighting a battle
He'll fix my eyes on Jesus Christ. I'll say that it is well. pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. God, I, just, I, I pray for everyone in this room, especially those who are hurting, those who are just swimming in, in grief over past hurts, present hurts, disappointments, broken dreams, whatever it is, God, that, um, that they'd just be able to just hold on to this, this glory that you promised to reveal to your sons and your daughters, that you love us with an infinite love, that's seen through the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that, God, we thank you for. Uh, for those in this room who do not yet know you, God, I just pray that they'd hear these words, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that you, O oh God, raise him from your son from the grave, that you will be saved. But that is it. The salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period. God, thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Have a great rest of your week.